Thank you for joining us for this last day of Muse Meets 2021. I hope you have found this week's panels and presentations to be enlightening and enriching as we have come together to envision what's next in the future of not-for-profit scholarly communications in the humanities and social sciences. Before we begin today's session, I would like to offer our land acknowledgement. Project Muse respectfully acknowledges and gives thanks to the Piscataway tribe, the indigenous people who are the traditional owners of the lands of the Chesapeake Bay region. We also acknowledge all indigenous peoples, the traditional owners of the lands and waters of the United States of America. This free virtual Muse Meets event expands on the tradition of Project Muse's annual meeting of participating publishers and builds on our celebration of Muse's 25th anniversary. We are excited to augment our programming this year with global community sessions that invite participation from our library partners and other stakeholders in scholarly communications. We feel it is vital now more than ever to encourage dialogue among the library, scholar and publishing communities so we can work together to envision a sustainable future. With this in mind, I'm pleased to introduce today's panel, Community Challenges, Collaborative Solutions, Emerging Library Trends for Publishers. In my role with Muse, I'm privileged to spend a great deal of time engaged with librarians, library consortium representatives, and other stakeholders in the library and archive space. I learned so much in these conversations about their pain points and challenges, innovations and emerging practices, priorities and values, and the wide variety of big, bold new ideas about how best to achieve our mutual goals of ensuring sustainable, equitable dissemination of trusted scholarship to meet the needs of researchers and students worldwide. Each year at Muse's Publishers Meeting, I'm able to share a selection of this learning with our participating publishers. And I'm thrilled that this year, I'm able to expand on that uh, by bringing speakers from the library community to engage directly with a broad audience of scholarly communication stakeholders. In convening this group of presenters, I spent a great deal of time considering the many timely and complex topics I've encountered in my conversations and at conferences over the past year. Openness, collaboration, transformation, bibliodiversity, curricular support, accessibility, shared principles, budgets, staffing, information literacy, equity and inclusion, decolonizing collections, pandemic response, remote access, shared access, the library's place, the library's mission, collective action, community practice. This list is long and we could easily have devoted an entire day to the discussion of these issues. This morning, I'm pleased to bring together four speakers chosen because they represent a variety of sizes and types of libraries and library organizations, and who will address topics that we felt were especially valuable for consideration in a broader community setting, engaging with publishers, researchers, and other constituents. They will share with you information on compelling new programs and initiatives, and also take you into one library's representative experience of and response to the pandemic. I will introduce each speaker prior to their presentation, and we will have time for Q&A with all speakers after all the presentations have concluded. I trust you're as excited to get, as excited to get started as I am. Our first speaker is Laura Massotten, Process Manager, Research and Open Scholarship for KU Leuven Libraries Arts, the department within the libraries that manages and develops services and collections for research and education for the Faculty of Arts, and more generally, the Humanities and Social Sciences Group. Laura's job focus is scholarly communication and open science, and she is a strong believer in fair open access. Together with Demi Verbeke, she is responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the KU Leuven Fund for Fair OA, which is the program I've asked her to share with us today. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Melanie, for the introduction. I will share my screen with everyone. Voila. So thank you for having me in this panel. I'm very excited as well to hear the other presentations uh, today. Um, I will jump right in with giving an introduction to the Key Living Fund for uh, Fair Open Access. And the tagline of the fund is, if you want change, try something new. That's a bit of the mantra that we always uh, use. And it's also the point made by Demi Verbeke, the initiator of the fund in a recent blog post that I uh, linked uh, in the slide. And it's also the point that I want to make today in this brief introduction to the Kiel Leuven Fund for Fair Open Access. I will try to be brief. 
um, both for a library and for a supplier of scholarly communication infrastructure, changing the way we approach and invest in scholarly publishing will be a necessary step towards a more sustainable ecosystem. But of course, as always, with change come some challenges. Library budgets, uh, library collection budgets, are traditionally set up to cover a range of uh, scholarly communication costs, such as book or journal acquisitions, licensing online resources, cataloging services, and so forth. But these budgets are not yet fully adapted to sponsor open science initiatives. And what can actually also be the case is that libraries can be reluctant to redirect their budget from these traditional costs, so to speak, to new forms of uh, scholarly publishing not only because a library might be a bit averse to change, but also because they might have doubts about the reliability of new open science initiatives, and or they can have concerns that their already stretched budgets do not allow supporting something additional. Besides this budget issue, another challenge is, of, is overcoming the well-known arguments against trying something new in the field of scholarly communication. I won't go into detail here, but just to mention, as you all know, the current academic reward system, the importance of institutional rankings and the prestige attached to legacy publishers are issues we will need to overcome if we truly want um, change. But not trying anything new also implies no change. And we therefore believe it is crucial to not only work with the traditional suppliers of scholarly communication, but to stimulate the development of new, innovative, um, most of the time nonprofit and community owned uh, initiatives. And in other words, we believe that a redirection of library budget is a necessary step libraries will have to take anyway in order to support um, researchers in their open access publishing choices. And we also want to make sure that we do not make the switch at the expense of the diversity of business models in the market of academic publishing. And this is exactly what we want to do with the Keir Leuven Fund for Fair Open Access, which was set up by Keir Leuven Libraries in 2018. The fund is exclusively devoted to the support of nonprofit and community owned initiatives, again, in the field of uh, open scholarship. It is not a library supported APC fund, um, which all too often, according to our opinion, results in channeling money to, again, the traditional suppliers. Instead, the fund is our way of making sure that at least part of the available library budget is safeguarded to support alternatives and to stimulate the diversity of business models. For the time being, the fund might only represent a small portion of how the library budget is spent, but it puts the spotlight on partners who are willing to try out something new, which is often cheaper, better aligned with scholarly values, more inclusive and more operable, and who therefore, in our opinion, deserve the support of the library uh, much more than suppliers whose primary aim is not to serve scholarship, but to serve shareholders. The fund has two components. Um, on the one hand, we support open um, access, or I should say open science, publishers, infrastructures, and initiatives. And on the other hand, we support open access books published exclusively by our own university press, which is Leuven University Press. But given the focus of today's panel, I will concentrate on the first uh, component of the fund in today's presentation. So with this, we finance innovative publishing initiatives and infrastructure, and we also cover membership costs for consortia or for advocacy organizations who focus on a nonprofit and academy owned approach to scholarly communication. We currently have a yearly budget of 60,000 euros available for this. Well, while this is already a nice budget, I mean, it's a start uh, and it gives us something to play with, but of course we simply cannot support everything. And we have to make a selection in what we can and cannot support with um, this fund. How we do this? Well, for this uh, selection, we partly count on others and we partly do it ourselves. So 
Um, SCOS in particular plays an important part in the selection process since SCOS recommends infrastructures which have already been rigorously evaluated by the SCOS board. And they also look at the government structure, cost, sustainability, and the future plans of the infrastructure. And because of our shared values with uh, what SCOS represents, the investments recommended by them tend to go on the top of our priority list in what we should support with uh, the fund. For the others, uh, we have our own vetting process, um, but we don't have um, a detailed checklist uh, in place. We are planning to provide more details concerning this process, um, but at the same time, we are quick to realize that making a complete checklist that would fit for all initiatives is just impossible. But still, there are some factors that play a determining role in our decision, and I will just share them here with you, it might inspire uh, others. So the essence is that we strictly limit the investments of this fund to infrastructure or the suppliers of said uh, infrastructure um, that serve scholarship rather than profit, as I have already mentioned. So important features for us are that uh, they have a government structure that secures that the academic community remains in the driver's seat. Of course, copyright retention by the author or authors is very important, and the organization should aim at sustainability, diversity, and equality. Transparency is also key. Um, a good website and clear communication already go a long way for us, but if an initiative is open to meetings and offers uh, supporting members, uh, perhaps membership of the board, well, then even better. And I also mean transparency in terms of costs. We, for instance, have absolutely no problem that some profits are made, that's, that's normal, but we do believe it's important that these profits are at least partially or, or entirely invested back into the academic uh, community. That's something we uh, try to consider. Of course, we don't ask for a detailed report uh, of expenditure. Um, it just with transparency, I mean, it really has to be and communication and open conversation between us and the initiative uh, we support. When vetting uh, initiatives, we of course also consider the opinion, the use by and the benefits for our own research community. For example, um, how actively do KU Leuven scholars currently use the platform? In what way would the server, uh, the service offer advantages to the research done by our scholars? These are also points that we take into consideration. But then there are also some more practical factors concerning the budget and contract uh, to consider. As I have already mentioned, the way the library budget is currently still structured um, might complicate support for an open science initiative. At Kiel Leuven, we are lucky enough to have this specific budget dedicated to open uh, science initiatives, but this is not a given for other uh, libraries we have learned. Um, and therefore, business models such as opening the future, for example, um, which is set up in a way that collection budget can be used to also support uh, open access publishing, might be an interesting option for a publisher to um, explore. Also setting up a library membership program that is specifically geared towards libraries will make the administration go a lot smoother, we have learned. Um, so um, yeah, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done by libraries to rearrange their collection building around open access content. Um, so there's work done on our side as well, but if both parties um, are willing to, to consider this, it might go a bit smoother to invest in open science. Um, we, of course, support something because we believe in the mission of the initiative. However, some kind of return on investment, so to say, can help to arrange the contract, since some concrete returns make it a lot easier to explain to our financial and legal colleagues why we should invest in this. Just as budget structures, financial and legal structures are not always already adapted to this new way of financially supporting open science, where do you not, where you not get an exclusive service or a license uh, in return? They really think still in terms of, okay, what do we get uh, for the money we pay? 
This doesn't have to be a big return and it really depends on the infrastructure. But for example, if we can put in the contract that they offer webinars and guidance or they deliver mark records or free DOIs, et cetera, this is already enough to make the whole process go a lot easier. And importantly for us, a yearly contract or an easy opt-out option is crucial because budgets in our case are approved on a yearly basis. So we can never guarantee long-term commitment. So offering yearly contracts to libraries uh, will create a lot more flexibility, uh, especially for those libraries who are still in the experimental phase and want to see what's out there and see what they can support on a yearly basis. On our website, you can find uh, the overview of everything we support. Um, the idea behind this overview is that other libraries can see what was already vetted by us and what we trust and can perhaps get some uh, inspiration from this. However, I should stress that we in no way claim to have an exhaustive overview of what qualifies for support, or we also don't claim to always get it right. Um, but important, I think, is that we are not afraid to make mistakes. Some of the thinking behind the fund is exactly that we have a bit of a budget to experiment with, and we are always aware that we will get it wrong from time to time. And this is actually another reason why a yearly contract is what we prefer so that we can just easily cancel if, uh, if this would be necessary. As mentioned, um, there's also a second um, section of the fund, which is uh, to subsidize open access monographs published by Leuven University Press. I don't have the time to go into detail, but we have made a video that explains uh, the, how it works and the application procedure. Uh, and also on our website, you can find an overview of how we um, operate this uh, open access book fund. I just want to mention here um, that it's open to everyone. So not only Kiel-Leuven uh, authors, uh, but it's open to everyone interested in publishing with Leuven University Press. And um, we are very happy to see that the support of open access books is actually um, a great success in proportion, of course. But um, while we are able to publish um, a, a good amount of books in open access, uh, but also in terms of the reach of these books, which is demonstrated by the readership data, which we uh, share online for each book published with the support of the fund. To conclude, um, because I'm considerate of my time, uh, with the same tagline as I have started, uh, if you want change, try something new. And if we all do our part, we can work together on a more sustainable future for scholarly publishing and hopefully implement a new way of thinking, both on the library side, but also on the side of the suppliers. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Laura. That's great. That sounds like such an interesting fund and, and a great initiative on the part of your university. So our next speaker is Lindsay Kronk, who is currently the Director, Collection Strategies and Scholarly Communications at the University of Rochester. But as of June, uh, we'll move into the new position of Assistant Dean of Scholarly Resources and Curation at Rochester. Lindsay has spent nearly a decade in librarianship, first in consortia and now in academia, a uh, honing approach to service and strategy that is data-driven, dynamic, and grounded in the pursuit of social justice. She believes that libraries are engines for knowledge creation and democratization, and that as such, library workers have a leadership role to play in discussions of the research enterprise. She's currently engaged in that effort at the University of Rochester River Campus Libraries, where she works extensively in coordination with fellow neural institutions, and recently co-authored the consortium's first public statement, Neural Demands a Better deal. I've invited Lindsay to share more about that statement with us today. Welcome, Lindsay. So glad to be here. Um, thank you all for joining us today and for uh, paying attention, right, to something that I think is a really exciting stride towards realizing the potential of collective action, which is something that from my very early days in librarianship, I, I was excited about and it is thrilling. I I'm not kidding. Uh, to be engaged in that work at Neural. So let me just share my screen and then we'll get going. So you full screen mode. So I'm here today to talk about values-based strategies 
and why neural demands a better deal and why we all deserve one. So I'm, you've heard my title and my soon to be title at the University of Rochester, but I'm actually here on behalf of the talented and amazingly uh, engaged team of the Neural Program Council. Neural is the Northeast Research Libraries group. Uh, we are a motley crew of private and public institutions, not only in the Northeast, so it's a little bit of a misnomer. Um, and recently we've come together around our commonalities and shared priorities, uh, continuing to evolve and step forward as a consortia from a past identity that I think was widely understood to be that of a buyer's club to a place where we are trying to leverage our collective heft, right, um, on to create a more sustainable, more equitable, scholarly uh, communication ecosystem. So today, again, I really want to center the why, because the why is what has grounded our strategy. And I want to also talk about the fact that I think that in our current, um, in our current global dialogue, right, around equity, diversity, and inclusion, our values need to be at the heart of our strategies and need to be at the heart of the way that libraries and publishers are approaching this work. So I wanna quickly highlight again, and I mentioned uh, that this is not, um, you know, we're not, we're not a system like the University of California. We're not a national organization like, uh, shoot, uh, the UK or, or CRKN up in Canada. We, we are a group of, libraries that have come together um, typically to submit what in the past were called big deals. So here are the core members of Neural. Um, they are, every one of these institutions that you see on the screen right now has a representative to what's called our program council, which in terms of our governance is sort of the active and lively um, body that is shaping our agenda moving forward with the expert guidance of our amazing um, staff member, Christine Damison, who is the executive director of Neural. Uh, Without this group, this diversity of perspectives, I would not be talking to you today. And it's an honor to have the opportunity to sort of represent what was very much a group effort, a team effort um, that we coalesced at a time when the urgency of COVID-19 made it clear to all of us that we needed, right? We needed to embrace um, change and think about more effectively leveraging our collective privilege and prestige on behalf of libraries everywhere, and more specifically on behalf of our researchers, right? Um, something that I've been meditating on a lot, and it's been highlighted in this in this conference as well, is that without preprints, we wouldn't have vaccines for COVID, right? We all understand that the scholarly process, the research process is not disconnected from our daily realities in ways that have led to an increasing understanding of the alignment, right, between the perspectives of libraries and of publishers. So again, um, these are the folks that I work with. Um, these are the institutions that they represent. And when you look through it, you're going to see um, not all of us will have the same sort of motivations based on taxpayer funding, right, that our public institutions may have and vice versa. Um, not all of us are giant institutions. Speaking for myself, I work at a, a small but mighty, right, um, research institution that punches way above its weight. And so when you're thinking about things like open access and like the future of publishing, my concerns are unique. And I have to represent not only my campus, right, but the way forward. And that's part of the reason that the values-based strategy we all started to understand made sense for us. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the process of drafting the statement um, before I jump into what the statement is all about. So key to the process of actually, again, um, living and fulfilling the, the possibility of collective action in this case was building increased engagement and the sense of the Neural Program Council as a team. So oftentimes in consortia, um, and I've been guilty of this myself, as a person who participates in a, a sort of variety of initiatives, uh, we all have work, lots and lots and lots of work at our individual institutions that, that keeps us occupied, right? And we rely on consortia actually to help us work more effectively. Um, but part of the reason increased engagement became possible in, in the during COVID-19, but even before, was we all started to really commit to one another in terms of participating in our monthly program council meetings. 
And through the process of discussing and exploring and speaking really candidly with one another, we began to realize that, and I, I work with some of, again, the most talented and pragmatic people you'll see. And I am from a long line of very practical collection practitioners. I um, Sometimes I jokingly call us collection strategies broads, right? People who have to keep an eye on the bottom line, um, have to pay attention to things like return on an investment. We are, we are creative, but we operate within constraints, uh, a crew of MacGyvers, if you will. So we, we came together and we started talking about what was possible and where our stops were, right? Because it's not, again, it's not something that we felt um, at the start was obvious. So we went through a really deep and exploratory process of a reflection and coming together, right, around commonalities and arriving at agreement in principle around what our values were. This was not an easy process. Um, and it, it also required um, additional coordination, additional work, and additional commitment um, to thinking of our institutions and representing our institutions, but also thinking beyond those institutions. Um, I was really inspired by the keynote um, earlier this week from, oh, forgive me, I have a note here. But Kathleen Fitzpatrick talked about the possibilities of collective action, right? Um, and a lot of what she had to say really resonated with the work that we've done at Neural. And it's, it's work that I think can be taken up by any group of, of folks that are willing to work in coordination. And I'm sure we're gonna hear amazing things from Big Ten and others about those pieces as well. But with Neural, it's additional, like sort of the additional joy of it is that we're all electing to work together in this way and electing to sort of think collectively about what could be better and invite others into our process as much as possible. So again, we worked really closely we put more time into the consortia, we put more time into coordination, and we put more time into strategy and design. And that was key to the process of developing the statement and to the process of planning the next steps, which I'm going to highlight a little later in this presentation. So now I wanna just quickly talk about, before I move into the statement, the statement structure and sort of the intention of the design of the document itself. So we start with some narrative and the the narrative was really important because, uh, and it's it's so funny because I'm always asking for short documents. I know someone in the audience today is thinking, Lindsey Kronk has asked me for three bullet points, right? Uh, nothing more than a page. Being concise and being clear was absolutely important to this document, but also important was the baked in cultural opportunity to talk about shared challenges, right? And, and um, shared alignments, past challenges and um, sort of the unfortunate and often adversarial framing that comes into play anytime libraries and publishers attempt to do work together. Uh, so we, we definitely wanted to highlight that we wanted something different and that we knew that asking for something different, a better deal, uh, would be something that would challenge the marketplace. Um, so we wanted to make sure that all of that was as clear as possible and also presented in a way that invited folks in to the process. Because again, that aspect of inclusive design is something that we really um, centered in this process as much as possible as we continue to think about our values as our strategies. Which brings me to, again, the part two, which is the values themselves. So there are five values, I'm gonna highlight them in this presentation that Neural chose to invoke and um, flesh out in the statement. And we're actually working at this point on a set of what we're calling preferred deal elements that are how we think those values should be enacted, right, in the new deals and the new agreements that we sign, the better deals. Um, guiding throughout all of this as well has been a desire to save one another time and to leverage the collective talent of neural librarians and neural users um, to sort of speak to the fact that we're all interconnected, right, within the scholarly communication ecosystem. And sometimes those roles are less visible to some or less understood. Um, sometimes those roles do have tensions and natural negotiating um, pieces to them. But invoking that community, right, um, became really crucially important as well as this process. And it is the community that drove the development of those values. So now I'm just gonna quickly highlight the document. Um, so you can go and find the actual uh, 
document itself. I've created a tiny URL for you to get there, um, tinyurl.com slash neural deal. Um, so this is that preamble that I mentioned. It invokes the MIT framework for publisher contracts. MIT is one of our members. It, it says that we are united in the work ahead. And it also points out that when we demand a better deal, we don't just mean a better price, right? So just a lot of helpful clarification here. And then the five values that I mentioned, right? Transparency, um, which that commitment to transparency, we don't just see it as the publisher's responsibility. We also see it as our own responsibility. And the statement was a first step. Sharing our preferred deal elements will be another step. Um, sustainability, right? Um, there was a statement that Greg um, Yo of the uh, CRL consortium made that's been lingering with me, which is, is it a serials crisis, right? Or is it a condition? And if it's a condition, it's a chronic condition. And we have to come together around sustainability to make um, scholarship open because we know it's more important than ever before, right? Equity, um, we need equitable um, participation. We need equitable um, terms, reproducibility on behalf of our researchers. And finally, the flexibility. So again, um, this is a very pragmatic document that is targeting some outcomes. We don't care whether that cat is white or black as long as it catches mice. And so we have five major negotiations coming up this year that are all going to use this project model and build off of this statement and continue modeling that public facing transparency forward. If you're interested in working with Neural um, on the publisher side as an institution, we really want to, we want to hear from you, we want to work from you. And that's what I wanted to close with today. So with that I'll say thank you and hand it off to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Lindsay. That was like so much uh, in, in a short presentation. Um, what a fantastic initiative and, and what great collective action happening there. And I would just like to say that I would like to nominate Collection MacGyver as one of the new ribbons for your badges that you can get at, at all the different conferences. <laughs> I think that one would be a big hit. <laughs> Uh, so up next, we have Maurice York, I'm sorry, Morris York, uh, Director of Library Initiatives at the Big Ten Academic Alliance. Uh, in this role, Morris is responsible for coordinating collective action at scale amongst the research libraries of the BTAA towards their commitment to realizing an interdependent networked future. The central initiative in Morris's portfolio is the Big Collection, a comprehensive strategy to strengthen an interdependent future for the 15 world-class research libraries of the BTAA by joining the separate collections into one collection, shared and fully networked across all physical and digital domains. Today, I've asked him to introduce us to the Big Collection initiative. So welcome, Morris. Great. Thank you so much, Melanie. And, and uh, thanks to Laura and Lindsay, I, this actually, this is a learning morning for me because I'm already absorbing so much. So this is really fantastic. Um, and it's really a great uh, pleasure to be talking to everybody today. So thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here and walk through sort of an overview of the big collection and particularly the priorities uh, around open knowledge and open scholarship. So uh, let's start with just uh, the big collection and the, and the theme here is building a knowledge commons for the Big Ten Academic Alliance. Um, and I'm gonna weave in that particularly and, and what it means um, for the uh, Alliance. So this is just a, to start with a quick map of uh, the Big Ten Academic Alliance, 15 uh, research libraries uh, with a huge geographic spread um, from Nebraska in the West, all the way over to uh, Rutgers and Maryland in the East. One notable thing about the Big Ten Academic Alliance, uh, it's existed for over 60 years at this point, and it is a very deep collaboration, much broader than the libraries that it extends across a wide variety of research and teaching collaborations across all of the universities uh, with a variety of stakeholders from the provost to arts and sciences deans, CIOs, the libraries are one component, a very important component of that picture. So a, a view of just work, this is what the Big Ten is about, is working at scale. So a little uh, view of what that scale means, um, over $10 billion in funded research, uh, 600,000 students, over 50,000 faculty serving them, and then this uh, very rich uh, alliance of the libraries supporting all of that teaching and research activity. Um, I'm throwing up here 114 million library volumes. That's what uh, the physical collection that the Big Ten libraries steward, but of course it's about much more than the books. Um, and that's what we're gonna start to dive into and talk about. If we zoom back and look at the Big Ten Academic Alliance then as a network, um, we really start to see the strength of the trust that's been built between the universities over the last 60 years. And this is really the essence of the big collection. 
uh, joining our strengths, creating something more powerful than the sum of our parts, uh, particularly articulating the needs of the whole and coordinating holistic action um, towards elevating the collective interest in the greater good. Um, it's the power of collaboration and it's really the power of the big collection. Um, so what is the big collection then? Um, and this is really it, just the lead line and the, and the heart of it is this uh, commu commitment to an interdependent uh, future as Melanie was describing, moving the 15 independent collections of the big 10 to be one collection shared and fully networked. And this is a commitment of all 15 Libraries, there was a moment in the fall of 2019 where all 15 uh, library directors got together and signed a sheet of paper that said, we will do this and it's the direction we'll go in. Quite a remarkable moment. Um, there's something important to recognize in the heart of this about collective action and what it means and particularly institutional uh, culture and character. These are 15 independent universities in different states, different geographies and with very different cultures. So at the heart of this is a recognition, collective action doesn't mean that we expect each other to behave the same, but that each brings our respective strengths. What we can do for each other is what we bring to the table, uh, what we can each be counted on for and what we can count on each other for. Um, the, so just a snapshot of what library initiatives is within the big 10. Um, there are a few important components. One is our peer groups. These are um, groups that we bring together of um, staff uh, librarians from all across uh, the 15 institutions in areas like acquisition, special collections, digital preservation, uh, IT, interlibrary loan, collection development, um, and things like that. Uh, we also have huge initiatives. These tend to be larger funded. They have specific goals. They have charges and MOUs and things like that. Uh, areas like shared print, we've got our cadre data platform, uh, which is out of Indiana University, the accessibility initiative is very well known and now includes a number of consortia that's an alliance uh, now that's growing. Uh, the GeoPortal initiative is out of uh, the University of Minnesota and then notably transformative agreements and sustainable publishing, um, which is the focus for today, of course. And then that we have a number of programs. You could think of these as sort of like long running infrastructure um, underneath uh, the, the, the uh, activity of the Big Ten um, at, at libraries, uh, shared licensing, uh, incredibly important one, uh, cooperative cataloging, a very long running um, network for sharing uh, language expertise. And, and in particular, um, uh, UBORO is our interlibrary loan uh, network, sustainable publishing, as I mentioned. So the question for the big collection is, we've got a lot of activity and a lot of things going on. Um, across our libraries is the big collection just another initiative and something that we spin up on the side and try to do alongside everything else that we're working on. Um, the picture is much more that the big collection is the center of gravity. It's really the lead idea that aligns all of the resources and activity across um, Big Ten library initiatives. So that's the important idea heading into this and it's how um, we recognize that, that open knowledge, uh, sustainable publishing, are an uh, incredibly important pillar of the big collection as a whole. And it's something that's part of the big collection really stands on the shoulders of everything that we've been doing together for the last 60 years. Um, so how is this coming together then? Let's, let's look at a little bit of the big collection and what are we talking about anyway? What is it really? Um, so to touch back to that circulating collection of books, um, there are 114 million volumes, give or take across the 15 research libraries. This is 22% of all the printed content in North America. This came out of a OCLC um, study that we did in partnership with OCLC. Uh, and in the, I believe it was in 2019 um, that did a, an analysis of the physical collection holdings. Um, more than half of those uh, are held by only a single BTA library and only 6% are duplicated in 10 or more BTA libraries. Um, there's a lot of duplication with other holdings and collections um, nationally in North America and so forth. Um, but within the Big Ten, these 15 collections, this is a coherent collection with very low duplication, um, very low duplication uh, and high uniqueness. They are research libraries after all. Um, but what's the scope of the big collection? We know it's about more than the physical books. And what are the dimensions of what we're really talking about if we think about making this one collection? Um, so there's the purchase collection, of course, there's the license collection, uh, there's our digitized collection, the unique digital assets that we're all creating, 
Um, there's data sets, right? Government data, commercial data, geospatial research data that we're creating. Um, not to mention the published collection, what's coming out of our university presses. Uh, 14 of the universities have active presses. And then this huge continent of open access. This was sort of my attempt to visualize and draw out if these were continents, what might it look like? Um, and we have really rich conversations about that continent of open access and whether it should be really called open access or even if it's a continent by itself or it's really sort of interwoven with the others. Um, and so the scope is enormous. And really the question becomes, what are we trying to do and where do we start? Uh, and and to, to move forward with this uh, sort of incredible ambition. So this is where we touch towards the higher purpose of this is creating a knowledge commons for the Big Ten Academic Alliance. Um, and just a, just a little orientation towards what does this mean and, and what do we think of as a knowledge commons is really these three uh, very important components that institutions, projects, and organizations there you see at the top, creating the knowledge infrastructures on behalf of the public interest, uh, open access itself, open access to public knowledge in the public interest, and then sustainable curation and preservation of scholarly and scientific knowledge, again, for the public interest, placing that at the heart. And what we face in the landscape today is that there are threats invading that knowledge commons. Um, and we can largely see these as for-profit and economic commercial focused um, threats. So the question isn't how do we counterbalance those and throw them away? The question is how do we bring balance to the knowledge commons and enrich it? Because our scholars, our students can rightly st step back from this landscape and ask really important questions like what gets saved? Who decides and why and on what terms? And really who gets to see what? And we have to lean into this and start to, the, these are not questions that can be answered, but we have to make progress. We have to do better and we have to actively take this up. So to just to wrap up here, to look quickly at the lead priorities for the big collection um, in the, uh, and this is where we're starting is creating the knowledge infrastructure and services for the knowledge commons. We'll start with the knowledge, with the infrastructure and build from there. Um, so discovery, the total pool of resources across the 15 Big Ten libraries, uh, delivery rapidly anywhere, regardless of who owns it or where it's held, um, knowledge creation, and this is where I'll wrap up here, radically expanding uh, the publishing opportunities and advancing open scholarship, and particularly knowledge preservation, then creating durable, scalable, open, and trustworthy knowledge preservation. So if we're going to talk about the open scholarship strategy, here are the components. Um, and, the, and the goal, and we'll place it right at the middle there, is sustainable, scalable, trustworthy, and just open knowledge ecosystem. And up at the top, we'll always have that higher purpose, always looking at advancing the growth of open science and open scholarship. Um, there are six very important components here uh, from elevating marginalized and unheard voices, transforming the journal marketplace, uh, building a portfolio of sustainable open content and open infrastructure. We heard excellent uh, there with the opening talk about the components that go into that. Uh, strengthening academy-owned repository infrastructure. Um, in the gray there are some of the areas we're actively working in um, for each of these components to start making measurable progress. Um, one thing I wanna highlight here is that this has to be a partnership as we move in each of these areas. Um, and just to bring into the picture a little bit there, uh, with studying and understanding the landscape up there in the purple, uh, developing uh, dashboards and insight based on open data and, um, uh, and open software. We're working with the uh, uh, Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative as we build out that view of publishing activity across the Big Ten. Uh, we have a great partnership with the California Digital Library as we're watching the lead that they've been taking for some time now on transformative licensing. And then in that sustainable business models and governance, and we saw a few of these earlier, uh, the work that we're doing with um, uh, organizations like PLOS, uh, DOAJ, and the Cambridge University Press. Um, so I'll close there and uh, hand off to our uh, next speaker, but um, I'm really encouraged by everything uh, hearing and seeing this morning and hope I've been able to add a little to the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Morris. That was a fantastic presentation. That's clearly a, an enormous undertaking with some very lofty but important objectives. So I think you have some really great work ahead of you. And thank you for sharing about that. I'll also say that my own uh, graduate education was in geography and my inner cartographer loved your continent map visualization. That was fantastic. So nice work there. Thanks for that.
Um, so just a quick reminder that we will have a Q&A with all of our panelists after this last presentation. So please enter your questions into the Q&A chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, our final speaker today is Jacqueline Parrott, who is Assistant Professor and Collection Management Librarian at Eastern Washington University Libraries and Learning Commons. She also serves as the library's religious studies uh, subject liaison and previously spent five years at the Moody Bible Institute Spokane Library. Besides an extensive customer service and leadership background, she has experience in all aspects of librarianship, including administration, reference, instruction, cataloging, acquisitions, technology, outreach, and access services. Currently, she manages the collections budget, resources, and personnel in the collection services unit at EWU. I recently heard Jacqueline speak about the experience of her mid-sized rural public master's level university in managing the economic, structural, and personnel impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, and I found it to be a really compelling and informative case study. So I invited her to share that with us today. So welcome, Jacqueline. Thank you so much. Um, everybody's presentations have been so exciting and encouraging, and I have a... <laughs> I fear that mine's a little bit more of a pessimistic outlook um, on what's going on in libraries, but we are still collaborating and still sustaining and doing our best. So this will just give you a window into what's been going on at our library uh, during this pandemic. So essentially, um, you can see my screen, hopefully. And uh, basically, Eastern Washington University um, is a medium sized uh, regional public university in Cheney. And we also share Spokane Academic Library with WSU downtown serving our Spokane programs. Uh, in fall of 2020, our enrollment consisted of 12,328 students and over 150 areas of study. In fall, um, the currently the library employs 34 library personnel, including one library dean, one faculty chair, and 13 faculty librarians. Before the pandemic, our university was already faced with drops in enrollment while all of higher education is faced with various changing demographic factors. However, COVID-19 necessitated an assessment of all of our collections budget and continuing resource subscriptions. To face some of the overall budget issues going on at our university, in July, 2021, the university's seven colleges will be restructured into four. The library will go from being a self-directed college to a non-autonomous one. The Library and Learning Commons will become the School of Libraries organized under the College of Professional Studies with four other unique schools and an additional department referring to one dean whose expertise is in psychology. Recently, our university faculty organization wrote a white paper to address what is known as crunch culture, a well-known term in gaming industries. Basically, it means crunch times occur all too frequently in any workplace where employees have had to regularly push themselves harder than normal to meet deadlines, facing passion exploitation. This happens in higher education when administration is micromanaging everything and not providing enough support or shared governance, but still expecting the same results with less resources. Employee health and productivity suffers due to excessive workloads and demands. So the pandemic, uncertainties around budget, reorganization, enrollment, turnover and layoffs, inconsistent strategic planning, uh, an accelerated and confusing program review and discontinuation process, and top-down management styles has many concerned and tired, especially since all faculty took a pay cut for the year and staff have had to take furlough time. So the collections budget was the main target for budget cuts this year since we've already lost many personnel. You can see the changes from when we were flourishing in 2018 when I first started to current status this fiscal year to our future status come July. For instance, the interim university provost became interim president after the previous president resigned due to a vote of no confidence from the teaching and library faculty. Since I started, the library has had three deans as a result of a resignation, death, and one serving in the interim. We've lost 10 other library employees due to retirements, resignations, and another death in this time frame. I absorbed one colleague's job that has recently been defunded along with our archivist position without the library even being consulted. And we will lose three more team members come July in the reorg, including our business manager, a librarian, and our interim library dean. Our current library faculty chair is stepping down. So, our library uh, provides access to 1.1 million physical items as well as thousands of e-resources. There are almost 150 continuing resource renewals to process annually. Since the pandemic began, each purchase request has had to be approved by the president's office due to the purchasing freeze already put in place, regardless of whether we had a multi-year license or commitment already in place for the purchase. For example, uh, we were questioned on why we were subscribing to a small regional newspaper for $36. 
and had to explain the archival value behind this decision. So therefore, each renewal we've made has had to be justified. To be fair and consistent, we needed a plan that would include making cuts across all departments and subject areas, which meant collaborating with all these stakeholders in the process. Clearly, many are affected by our subscription decisions. While vendor reps are the main external contacts we have as librarians, clearly publishers and authors are affected by any decisions made as well. At our university, all librarians serve as subject liaisons. So made they, they made most of the recommendations for what to cut or keep. Then approval was sought through the chain of command. So we developed this tiered collection assessment approach. It was designed so librarians could rank our continuing resources by four tiers, which are outlined and explained here. Subscriptions were canceled based on the methodology employed. Most tier one and two resources were renewed as long as the data aligned meaningfully. Tier one resources were considered essential to operations. Tier two should only be cut if necessary. Tier three resources were scrutinized further, while almost all tier four rated resources were canceled since they were considered nice to have, but not crucial to curriculum. Each librarian would rely on the quantitative data here, such as cost per use and qualitative data, such as mission, be available before ranking the resource that fell within their subject area accordingly. Countless spreadsheet statistics and meetings later, we have permanently cut 25% of our collections budget. You can see the change to our budget over time in this graph. It has remained flat or decreased for some years now. So changes to resources this fiscal year included 27% of our continuing resources being cut, but we increased our spend by 4%. Um, and then with 2% in planned new subscriptions cuts, that brought us back down to the permanent reduction of 25%. Just so you can get a picture of the types of things we cut, um, we cut 70% of our print journals. We cut 12% of our monographs and we percent, cut 100% of our journal binding budget. 100% of our year-end or one-time purchases were cut, not counting monograph spend. 100% of our standing orders were cut and 40% less was spent on one streaming media plan by mediating requests. We are currently tracking faculty feedback we receive in a separate spreadsheet so we can understand how decisions have impacted curricular support. But we are trying to get creative, <laughs> okay? So this is where the creativity comes in. So essentially, first of all, vendor love in the time of COVID has been amazing. Um, some positive highlights of this past year included vendors providing expanded or temporary free access to their resources, as well as most offering flat renewal rates. Our staff activated these relevant collections available and created a widget to track these changes so they could easily be deactivated once the deal expired. We added over 92 collections, which included over 59,000 journal and book titles within them. They provided much needed additional electronic access to research for students and faculty when the library building closed and all classes moved online. So this included some publishers that Project Muse hosts, including University of California Press Journals, University of Michigan eBook Collection, and Duke University Press. We also added Project Muse open access books. So a big thank you to vendors and publishers who are willing to provide these perks. It also gives us an insight into what was used more and what we could potentially add in the future from these collections. Um, we also canceled some resources in, in order to acquire others. And one of the new resources we added was Project Muse. However, we actually still had to cancel um, some to make this happen. We have had Project Muse on our wish list since June of 2019. So the primary interest comes from faculty teaching on women, gender, and racial studies. Our diversity and inclusion librarian continue to advocate for Project Muse. And in particular, our library has been lacking comprehensive coverage of sources on Africana studies. But there were also some specific titles getting a lot of interlibrary loan requests, such as pedagogy, and other journal titles, such as feminist formations that were key to our faculty's fields. As the religious studies liaison, I was also happy we could add some more religious titles since we're lacking curriculum support in this area. Due to budget uncertainty and concern from our humanities librarian, with the title overlap that Project Muse had on some other platforms, we just opted to hold off until now. But then we canceled a larger package that included several of the duplicate titles. And some teaching faculty, faculty continued to be frustrated with embargoes that existed for particular titles through other aggregators that Project Muse had full text for. So we actually took a survey monkey poll with library faculty to help finalize our choice between Project News and another resource. Project News got the most votes. So thanks to our consortia buying power, we got a great prorated rate for the remainder of the year. We are with Orbis Cascade Alliance, which is wonderful. 
So, oops, not quite there yet. I'm ahead of myself. I'm getting excited. I'm not, I gotta <laughs> run to the finish line here. <laughs> um, anyways, we explore some cheaper subscription alternatives for less cost. We also utilize some other different funds and we uh, consistently reevaluate endowment funds and seek more endowment funds. We also advocated that other departments split the cost of a resource with the library or fund it fully if they had the funds. For instance, this year, two departments each fully funded new resources they determined were needed after the pandemic hit. So we're trying to get as creative as we can in these tough times. Another thing is that, that this past year and this project have highlighted this, how important e-resources are. We would not still have the library uh, resources to offer without them or without the technology that gives us a chance to work together to serve our stakeholders. Hence, this is why we cut a lot of print journals, knowing they simply aren't as accessible or utilize as heavily as their E counterparts. We really only kept print ones that were bundled with E or we were not available, able to IP authenticate them. We tried to draw teaching faculty's attention to OER's um, open educational resources and eBooks. And we opted to just yeah, subscribe to Rapid ILL to get content out faster to students and faculty. Um, we did some other things as well, but for the sake of time, I'll just show that we did create two different research guides uh, for communication. And basically we wanted to communicate our changes to faculty and students transparently. Um, so I created one of these guides highlighting the subscriptions we'd renewed, canceled or acquired for this fiscal year and updated it in real time. Uh, we also uh, created a guide for the COVID-19 uh, vendor resources um, and pointing as well to the OERs and other COVID uh, information that's out there. It's hard to say what the future holds for library budgets and collections, let alone higher education, but we know that a library is only as good as its resources and services, which means it needs good funding for personnel and collections. All we can do as professionals is continue to adapt to these changing times, knowing we all need each other to work together to support students and researchers. So I'd like to say thank you, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. I just, I, I loved the presentation that I heard from you earlier, and I'm so glad you were able to share uh, sort of a, a, an expanded and revised version of that with us today. I think it's, as we talk about dialogue and bringing audiences together, that little sort of glimpse under the hood of what really goes on in a library in a situation like this is so important for authors to understand, for publishers to understand, uh, you know, researchers, administrators. Um, it's, it's really enlightening to, to see the process that you went through. And a little bit of muse love, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, that's a, a nice way to end, uh, end the presentations here at Muse Meets today. Um, so we're now going to open the floor to questions for any or all of the presenters. I see we've had a couple uh, come in on the Q&A already. And I'll also just mention we did get a little bit of a late start due to the audio problems, but um, our presenters have agreed to stick around a little bit longer as they're able. And of course, the, the Muse staff will as well. Um, so we will extend the question period till about 1125 um, rather than the original scheduled time of 11. 15. So hang with us if you can. So I'll start uh, with a couple of the questions here that have come in from the audience and uh, I will just sort of uh, let whoever might want to jump in uh, and answer, uh, feel free or else I'll call on you. <laughs> um, so the first one is most institutions are active in multiple collaborations. What are the challenges and opportunities for libraries and scholarly communication inherent in how institutions engage multiple networks of dependency? That may be especially relevant for our, our consortia representatives when you have members that are, you know, part of both your group and other groups. How do those dependencies come into play? Uh, Morris or Lindsay, you want to jump on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I, I'm happy to start. This, this is an incredibly important question um, across the Big Ten Academic Alliance because um, our members, I mean, 15 research libraries, but are each engaged in multiple networks um, uh, alongside of the Big Ten as well. So there is no imagination of, oh, the Big Ten could just carve off. And well, the, it, the interdependence <laughs> spreads broadly, uh, both nationally um, and, and internationally. And, the, and that really reflects the way that our faculty work and the way that students work as well. There is no bubble um, and the collaborations are naturally across. Um, and I think that is what points to um, really what's so important about the topics we've been talking about today is that there is such opportunity for network and scale. 
Um, and for influence across the networks, we all learn from each other. And it's actually by banding together that we create the real strength. Um, and this turns into uh, open access is a global movement and it's been moving for 20 years, right? This is not a flash in the pan and it is uh, all of us joining our hands together to create something much larger. So I think that is really what's so encouraging is seeing the, uh, all of what we can think of as adjacent networks are really all part of one whole and uh, work, working together. I just wanted to say that I also think that the real opportunity is for us to think about collective talent as well, right? To make things easier for ourselves. Like, again, I'm very practical and very pragmatic. I know I only have so much time and energy. And I know that that is true of every person I work with, collaborate with through a variety of networks, right? So thinking about how are we strategic with that talent and that time, I think is also just a, a piece that I always think of because in addition to everything else with this, this pandemic, people are really burnt out and people are experiencing a collective trauma, right? And so I also think that that can be a way that in our consortia and in our design of our consortial relationships, expectations, deliverables, um, we can we can extend that grace, right, to one another. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that gets me hyped about all of this. That's great, thank you. Anyone else wanna to add to that before we move on? No, okay. Um, so this is a, a great question that I think harkens back to a comment that really struck me during Wednesday morning's panel when Sylvester Johnson talked about uh, us being tenants of the digital infrastructure um, and that being perhaps a concern um, with so much of, of the infrastructure that we use being owned by private corporations um, and that perhaps public institutions should be reconsidering that. So here's a question that uh, asks, what is the potential of community owned infrastructure? Um, are the upsides of community technology worth the potential local, com excuse me, uh, compromises, local compromises? Uh, not to <laughs> go into it. No, go ahead, Lizzie. That would be. <laughs> I just okay. So, like, the thing is, there's um, librarianship is haunted, right, by the the open source and, and community, like the community failures of the past, and it's it's a place where. Um, a lot of the neural experiment that we're, we're engaging in right now, um, part of what we're doing is we're exercising that for each other, right? And we're, we're proving that if you have trusting relationships, you can build the things you need. And I think, I think it's a sort of interesting extension of the notion of mutual aid, right? Which has also been such a, a crucial focus of, of our time. And how do we make that happen? I think that we have to overcome it is, is sort of my, my short answer because the more we let, and this was a part I really loved of Maurice's presentation, like the more we let these corporate inter, uh, interests um, shape what scholarly communication looks like, the more we are setting up our researchers and our institutions to fail. Yeah, and maybe to add, that's also what we try to do with the fund. I mean, I wouldn't say that we all need to build our own infrastructures, uh, like individually, that every academic, ac ac academic should invest in that. I think it makes more sense to, to sponsor those open source, open science initiatives that are already out there instead of only looking towards private own, privately owned uh, solutions. So that's how we try to, um, to tackle this, this issue. Anyone else, Mars? I, I might just add, I, I mean, I, I've worked in um, community and open source software communities for a long time um, and they get messy and there are disagreements and there are things that fail. And then there are things that really work out and there's stuff that we build that's great that just doesn't work together, you know? And then you got to start over again. You got, but this is what's beautiful about community is you can bring constant attention to it and we can constantly improve um, the thing that, corporate and private interests have going for them is they can create coherent strategies that go directly to the heart of things and uh, can just direct enormous resources. But we can't allow knowledge to become privatized. I mean, this is a mission that goes up and stretches out and spans over hundreds of years. This is, this is human knowledge, right? And that's our charge. And the answer does lie in community action and in cooperation. Um, and that's hard and it has incredible risks and lots of things can go wrong, but that has to be absolute resolve to continue and press forward and become better because the risks of what happened if we don't are too enormous. So I, I firmly believe in it and the opportunities are there um, and all we have to do is lean into it. Great. 
Great, thank you. So sort of to take a different angle um, on this question of, of infrastructure and building, one of the, this is a question that I uh, had after thinking about the panel on Wednesday. Karen Wolf from the Omohundra Institute talked on Wednesday about the value and necessity of many small scale solutions to, challenge, to challenges in scholarly communications in publishing, noting that these recognized how different disciplines have very diverse and specific needs and structures for doing and communicating research, and that small scale efforts can often address those better than a one size fits all option. She has also written previously that insisting on scalability as a key value for infrastructure by its nature flattens out the very diversity that drives innovative scholarship. So how does what you're working on right now address these different needs and priorities among disciplines? And are there any other, um, other small scale solutions that you're aware of that you think are especially effective or hold great promise? Well, just in general, I, I definitely agree <laughs> with this. I think every discipline has its own needs concerning digital infrastructure, but also concerning open science or open access business models. For example, the diamond open access business model is a good solution for uh, humanities and social sciences, but not always for the biomedical uh, sciences. So I think we need to be aware of this and not only put all our effort and support into one open science uh, solution, so to say, but really try to, to acknowledge the diversity that is needed. And that's again, what we try to do with the, with the fund to try to ensure a, a diverse ecosystem and try to avoid a monopoly of one infrastructure or one business model. Uh, even in an open science world, uh, world I don't think we, need, we want a monopoly again. Um, so yeah, I definitely agree with, uh, with that statement. Anyone else want to jump on that one as well? No, okay, we'll move on. We do have a, an audience question specifically for Morris. Um, sorry, <laughs> vanity is, is losing out. <laughs> so uh, can you say more about what radically expanding publishing opportunities uh, are going to look like and what kind of publications might be produced? Yeah, sure. Uh, absolutely. So, and this might actually stem over the last question about the disciplines as well. So um, one of the things that's evolved as the marketplace has become more driven by uh, things like APC models and things like this. And this is what part, what's important to me about starting to work with PLOS and their community action program is PLOS is the one that introduced APCs 20 years ago. And now it's saying, you know what, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. Maybe we need to try something else while an, uh, other parts of the publishing industry go firmly down into APCs. And they say, well, we need a different gesture. Um, what that's done in, on, on the one hand is created large inequities in who can publish, who can speak, where research comes from. Um, there's really just gross disparities, for example, between the global north and the global south, but within and across disciplines as well. Um, and the humanities become particularly impacted by models that work for the sciences, but don't work in humanities at all. Um, and trying to bring attention to, so that's what this radically expanding publishing opportunities means, trying to bring equity into the field. And it's not just the, those who have research dollars and those who don't, right? So the humanities often the lack of research dollars and things like that. Um, so models that are working in the sciences where there's a lot of funding and things like that, that is not present in the humanities, just don't translate. Um, and so trying to bring this uh, lens into the kind of arrangements we make in publishing, the scholarly monograph, incredibly important in the humanities, not so much in the sciences, right? It's much more based on articles and those types of publications. So bringing the appropriate models and arrangements into each one of these spheres um, so that we don't have things like caps on publication, so that um, our authors and research aren't running into artificial limitations because of what others are doing or others in their same discipline or in other disciplines and things like that. And that's the piece of promoting freedom that has, has to be driven by the, the researchers and what's most appropriate for their publications and their voices. And they're not running into artificial constraints and caps because of that. Um, and I'd say what we're at the beginning of is doing better and learning from lots of really great people that are working here on what it looks like to be able to craft those deals so that we can uh, create those kind of um, opportunities. So um, I, that's where I'll hedge a little bit and say, we're gonna get so much better as we move forward because we're still learning and so many have been here already and there's so much that we can pick up and learn and exactly how that looks and the elements we can bring into doing that. 
Great, thank you. <clears throat> so here's a question that I think Jacqueline perhaps uh, speaks particularly to your presentation and, and the experience that, <clears throat> that you described to us. On Wednesday, uh, Liz Mangle from the Johns Hopkins Libraries on, on her panel made a, a wonderful analogy regarding the ineffectiveness of seeing the challenge of materials costs and library budgets as only a library problem, um, comparing it to trying to solve a complex algebra problem, but only working on one side of the equation, which as we all know is, is uh, you know, not going to get you to the answer. So what do you think are the most important variables on the other, the non-library side of that equation that will be necessary to work on in order to reach a solution? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do think it just goes to show you, like I talked about just how we all need each other and we all work together because, you know, if we can't subscribe, just, it's like we all go down together otherwise, especially for public universities that are struggling, like we're only 50% state supported now, um, you know, so we're having to look for, you know, we are not heavily endowed, you know, like some universities. So um, I just really think that um, you know, being able to like break up the packages more, um, being able to cater more to um, directly, you know, the needs of each program and curriculum, that's been really huge. I mean, you know, we're seeing that for our journals, of course, we want more full text e content, but then for our humanities and, we, and other areas, art especially, we still need the print. And so that, you know, led us to have to start shipping books out, you know, during the pandemic because we still had things um, that weren't available to the public online. So I guess I just see a couple different, I don't see an avenue forward, um, except that I wanna be with some of these other people here. <laughs> Take me, no, I'm just kidding. I mean, I just think I wanna, yeah, I wanna see a little bit more innovation and a little bit more drive. I mean, I think we're, like I said, everybody, you know, you just start to get tired. This crunch culture thing is real. It's like, how much more can you do with less? You know, we have to get more creative. I mean, the consortium buying power is huge, but um, I don't have any of the total creative solutions except that we have just been pulling from whatever fund we can and from whatever outside sources we can. We're, we're asking our, our foundation to please go get us, um, you know, more money. <laughs> so, I mean, I just, but, but, it, but unfortunately, um, yeah, I mean, you can't just keep but like I said, the flat renewals were huge this year because you can't just keep rising price. You can't just keep raising rates. I mean, our, you saw our budget. It was like flat and then down. So, you know, libraries aren't being given more money. And we're, we're of course, living in a little bit of this anticipation of not even having autonomy anymore. And are they going to, you know, we tried writing our own white paper saying, hey, there's not other libraries that are following this model. You know, uh, what are you thinking? <laughs> this makes no logical sense, and it doesn't seem like it's going to save you money in the long run. Um, so, but we're also really hoping that maybe from an, somebody coming in from an outside perspective, we'll be a little bit of a champion for our library, and you know, can maybe make some connections that our previous dean couldn't. I mean, higher education just completely suffers from institutional inertia, so we do need some of those creative um, outside people to come in and kind of shake things up. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer, except this is something I think about all the time. <laughs> and I would love to, you just, you just have to be willing to go, to take a risk and go a different route. So that's what I would add, <laughs> if that's anything. <laughs> Lindsay? Yeah, Jacqueline, I completely like, I'm with you. And, and I think a big part of the challenge too is the way it turns into this big negative feedback cycle, right? Where then faculty members don't have access to the resources they need. Um, we we struggle on every side of this equation. And I put it in, in our, Liz Mingle always has the best metaphors. Another one that she uses that I use all the time is if you're just paying attention to the shark in the water, you're missing everything else that is coming, right? It's a big old, it's a big old ocean. And so it's, it's challenging, I think, sometimes to have the right perspective in this and a place where I really see an alignment and a possibility for, again, I want collaborative co-creative process with our publisher partners. I want them to engage with us. When I talk about um, shared infrastructure, I don't mean like, let's have another open source, like, you know, breakdown across the field. I'm, I'm saying like, what would it look like if we honored the fact that functionally the investment libraries make in your infrastructure is handing you money without sharing sharing ownership, right? Like, like and, and how can we overcome some of those challenges as well? And, and another place where I think there's tremendous opportunity is for publishers to go to bat for us, right? Like we're your allies in this, like we all thrive and flourish 
right? When, when we understand and respect and acknowledge one another's labor and expertise. Um, so it's, it's, it's a place where I would just, I would love, I would love to see um, folks growing, right? And, and I mean that like across like about the value of library labor, right? And what we bring that is significant, important scholarly communication expertise without which the enterprise will not function. Yeah, and I think just briefly, I think we even have to look at the music industry and how that's shifted. I mean, you know, the way that the content is out there, um, they, you know, they've clearly come up with other ways to, to drive people to the sources and still make money. I mean, at a cost and everything, but I do think, you know, we can't just continue just pouring more money in and, and then it's not, it's not even getting the views or the access that it needs, you know? So I would just think we gotta look at where other things are going. I mean, I would say the streaming media thing is probably the most uns unsustainable thing in libraries right now, but that's for another conversation. <laughs> well, that's, this is, this is great. And I think that's a really fantastic way to sort of bring it full circle um, here as we, you know, we really do think about those collaborative collective solutions um, and also sort of envisioning what's next, what might come next. So thank you all so very much. I hate to end this conversation because it's fascinating and and I'm learning so much and I feel like I could talk with all of you for another hour easily, but, <laughs> but this is the end of our program for today. So thank you again so much, Laura, Morris, Jacqueline, Lindsay for joining us, um, for helping us create this really great panel. Um, and with that, I will say also thank you everyone who came to the panel today uh, to attend the session. And I will turn it over to Kelly Squazo uh, to close out Muse Meets 2020, 2021. <laughs> Thank you, Melanie, and a huge thank you to our panelists for such compelling presentations and discussions. Um, it's been a truly engaging and inspiring week. Um, as you heard on Tuesday, we listened to our keynote speaker, Kathleen Fitzpatrick, share her perspectives on a more generous future for humanities librarians, publishers, and scholars. And our panel discussion that was noted um, today about on Wednesday, um, if you missed these conversations, don't worry. You can view them as well as today's panel discussion on the videos tab of the meeting platform and also on the project Muse YouTube channel. So that concludes our programming for Muse Meets 2021. We thank you all for spending part of your week with Project Muse, and we hope to see many of you in person very soon. Have a great rest of your day.